Welcome to Founders and Friends Podcast with Scott Owner Cruise Consulting. And today, my very special guests are Steve Tesler and Ted Borquez of California Bank Commerce. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Scott. Thanks, Scott. My pleasure. So, uh, Steve, yeah, Steve and I became, we've been friends for a while, but we became super close during mm -hmm. the PPP COVID era of 2000 when I was texting and calling Steve pretty much every day <laughs> to find out what was, what the government had done that day on PPP. Yeah. And I had to tell you, Scott, I had no clue based on Mr. Mnuchin's announcement on Wednesday that you could uh, make your application on Friday and you'd have money in your account. And I said, Oh my God. <laughs> well, we both, I think we both complained quite a bit about the government's, um, Hey, the money's going to run out. So you better hurry up messaging, which destroyed all of us and was very tough, but we made it through. And I always like to say that the best relationships are built in tough times. So Steve was awesome. And, uh, and then recently, uh, Ted came on board at California Bay and Commerce. So maybe just kind of, you know, maybe Ted, you can start by retracing your career and then we'll get to Steve sure. and your background, who you are and, and, uh, what you bring to the table when working with startups. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, and, and Scott, you forgot that, you know, I knew you back when you were working on the dark side, right? <laughs> That's you right. Were, you That's were a right. venture debt lender way back then. So we, we do go back, uh, some period of time, but, uh, so yeah, uh, just kind of, you know, thanks for having me. This is, this is great. Um, and I'm happy to be here at California Bank of Commerce, but uh, sort of retracing my steps in my career and kind of where we got here. Uh, and I always go banker, entrepreneur, banker. You know, I started out in banking uh, at a college at Union Bank and I was credit trained there and, and spent five years underwriting deals. And, you know, we'll get my age, you know, back in the early 90s. And I was a young guy and tech was a little bit big. It was a little bit different as far as tech. It was bigger tech, public company tech. And they said, hey, you're a young guy. You probably know this stuff. So fortunately for me, I got to underwrite a lot of the technology deals, which which was great. Um, but at the time, and then, you know, startups were beginning getting a bit big and, you know, everybody was dumping capital into the market. And so I'm a young kid and I said, hey, yeah, let's, let's go do this. So after five years of underwriting deals, I left and entered into my first startup. Um, and I love to say that I learned something in each one of my three startups that I was was in. The third one worked out. I did have a third successful exit um, at the end of 2007, allowed me to take some time off, sort of, uh, I actually started a fourth startup with some friends of mine in the golf business, which was, which was great. Um, and that was a lot of fun, but more of a labor of love. Uh, and then, you know, that transitioned into, you know, more of a labor of love than a successful <laughs> business model. Um, so which is I learned a lot about uh, markets and verticals and which ones you can really access and become successful at. Um, and then I got a call in, in late 2008, which is crazy when the banking world was was imploding. Um, and my old boss who hired me out of college said, hey, at US Bank, we'd love to start our technology lending practice. What do you think about coming back to banking? Um, and I said, well, let's give it a shot. And so that was the first thing. And, and that started an eight year run. And so we built out the technology lending platform, granted a little different, you know, they were larger corporate deals, um, somewhat cash flow break even type deals. And so then that led me into this whole process of banking. My, my background between being on, for, have been on both sides of the table, you know, on structuring debt deals as well as negotiating debt deals, uh, put me in a good place to, to really build out, uh, build out platforms for other banking institutions that didn't have technology lending platforms. And so I've done it for U.S. Bank, you know, for Home Street, and then now for most recently for uh, for California Bank of Commerce, which I'm which I'm really happy about. So. So, yeah, it's been great. That's amazing. And that's that you and I met when you started at Union Bank. Or right at, U at, at that's, U.S. That's Bank. When I was when, when we were at U.S. Yeah, you started, so that's sorry, okay. US I, I started sorry. at Union Bank back in the day. But yeah, when we first started to get together, that was at U.S. Bank. And that was a very specific model and using, you know, you remember in 2008, everybody was flight to quality, you know, and that sort of thing. We had a very strong balance sheet, lots of capital until we were you know, the crazy kids on the block. I remember going in and talking to to CFOs and going, hey, we're out here starting a brand new group and we're lending money. And they're looking at me like, have you read a paper recently? Yeah, <laughs> the banking industry <laughs> is imploding. But, you know, we had, it was a good opportunity. You know, we, we it was a good opportunity. We, we, we got a lot of sort of later stage pre-IPO deals because we had a big balance sheet. We could put a lot of money to work. Um, and it just worked out. It was, it was a good, it was a good run at, at that, at that stage in the market. So we were, we, you remember Lighthouse was saying we had just closed the fund and it was unbelievable. It was like the greatest, maybe it might be the best investing lending time of yeah. my career. You know, that was so good for you guys for having. Yeah, no, no, it was great. It's awesome to see a, 
and then awesome to see at California Bank of Commerce. Like, I've, you know, it's it's really you're starting up like a whole new new venture inside the bank, and it's I'm, I'm very excited about it. So that's why I want to have you on the podcast. So, and Steve, do you want to give your your quick background? Absolutely. I don't know if I I I loved uh, uh, Ted's one of Ted's comments about labor of love, <laughs> and 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 my labor of love after college was was a uh, racquetball. And and that's and I was very passionate about it, and I played a lot of it, and I played competitively, and I thought that was going to be my career, <laughs> until I had a rude awakening and found out there are actually people that are better than I am. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it was a. I tell you, I, the reason I share the story is because it was a great experience for me in helping me develop my career in the sense that, you know, it was it was it was competition. I enjoy competition. We all enjoy winning. I mean, and somebody there are winners and losers. And um, you know, as 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 you as you move up the food chain, you find out that things get more competitive. <laughs> and, and and so at some point, I, I realized that uh, as fun as and and you have to enjoy it. And and that's one thing I really enjoy. I mean, I'm very passionate about things, and I really and I think it's important to be passionate. I think that's one thing that's emblematic of California Bank of Commerce is that we're passionate about business. And so that passion has always been part of me. That competitiveness has always been part of me. And so after, after I had my epiphany in, in racquetball, um, I said, well, I jumped into something more mundane like accounting. You know, you know being a public accountant, being in, in, you know, becoming a CPA, and I thought, geez, how could that? That's so different than being <laughs> on a racquetball court. But, you know, it, for me, it was it was really an education and it was, it was a great learning experience because you got to see businesses from so many, uh, not only different types of businesses, but you got to see what makes business run and what makes business not run on some days and run better on other days. And so that was, it was a great foundation for me, but the thing that was always present in, in my DNA was, you know, this, this sort of competitiveness. And that to me, is is kind of emblematic of what I do today, and that's really focused on sales and marketing. And so I always I wanted to steer my career in finan in in public accounting and eventually in banking towards the sales and marketing aspect of it. And so uh, it, and that was a bit of an uphill battle because in some accounting is not used to sales. That's not something you do in the in the because we get business through referrals, and yeah. we, we do the same thing in banking. Yeah, get business through referrals, and and certainly that's critically important. But what what I realized over time too is that sales and marketing are an important part of what we do in accounting and what we do in banking. Yeah, and so the ability to translate that into um, and to perpetuate my career has been really predicated on being being able to blend the two: the passion for business, the competitiveness, the desire, the drive, but also. Yeah. The fact that it's an integral part of what makes business run and what 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 allows businesses to grow, and so I've I've always been oriented, to, but I've always been oriented towards business. Business. Well, I'd say I'd add one other thing, which is what really struck me when we really got to know each other during the COVID stuff was you guys are competitive and you built a great business, but there's a lot of compassion at California Bay and Commerce, like you know lenders. People love their lenders when things are going well, but when things are tough, that's when the lenders, that's when those relationships are really yep. tested. And I, you and I, I remember talking through those, really, those are some really tough times for a lot of businesses that you guys banked and you were there for them. And I remember you talking about like restructures and making sure that they could yep. survive and get them through COVID. And I saw you doing that and I heard you doing that. And so that's another, I mean, that's just another reason why I'm excited about you guys getting into the venture debt world is that you have the, that foundation of compassion and working with the founders and bringing that to venture debt is, is awesome. Well, and I that's think what, a lot of it, I, I think a lot of it for me, Scott, is, you know, having those, you know, almost 10 years of being in startups, you know, I, I mean, I was there. I mean, I did, you know, I did credit card roulette to see who was going to, you know, you know, <laughs> help make payroll yeah. or do credit card roulette to say, Hey, we yeah. need to do this. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's, a uh, it was a tremendous learning experience to go through and it's, you know, while, there's high levels and high degrees of stress, you know, as you're going through it, it's, it's just, just such a learning experience. And that's what I love about it. And I, you, you, going back to Steve's point, I mean, we're obviously passionate, we're obviously competitive. 
and um, having gone through that process has only made us better as we we become bankers. And yeah. I and I think, yep. you know, one of the other things we talked about is like, you know, why did you come here? Why did I come to CBC? And I think the cool thing about CBC when I had left some of the other institutions, you know, they were all larger banks, right? Larger banks, not from Silicon Valley, and um, and coming here. You know, these are local local guys who started local you know people guys and gals who started this this bank. They have had successful exits for banks, but what that means is they started from scratch. They started from zero, so they've built the business right, and so they've experienced. And you know, and Steve being one of the or, you know one of the founders here and earliest guys has seen this grow. And so I think that's the important part is we're you know we're not just a banker who's always been a banker. We've actually you know, built businesses and even the bank that we have here at CBC is something that has been built and is being built. So you're kind of going through some of the same, you know, sort of trials and tribulations that, you know, our clients are going through our, you know, the, the other entrepreneurs out there in the world. Yeah, Scott, if I can jump back in for a sec, I, I would say that um, Ted is, is spot on and that the, you know, relationships are created and they're created and they're nurtured but the value of them isn't really realized until companies hit a speed bump mm -hmm. and challenge, have, have something that they need to get through that, and they need support, they need help. And that's when the relationships are truly tested. And to me, that's when they're cemented. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we cemented a lot of relationships over the past 18 months because our clients knew we were there for them. And, and it wasn't lip service. It wasn't, gee, now that I really need you, <laughs> I can't reach you. That's not what this is about. But but that um, it, it and it's hard it, it's hard to measure the value of the relationship when things are very rosy and things are when all the arrows are pointing up or pointing up and sort of sideways. Mm -hmm. But it's it's hard it's hard to measure it then. Um, but it's really measured when things start going a direction that needs to get corrected. Right. And that's I totally agree. And you guys have both have the operating background. Steve is a, you know, very, very early team member at California Bank Commerce and Ted with your startup experience. I mean, I've gone through it too. I got to say when I worked at Lighthouse, I didn't fully appreciate the entrepreneurial journey and how difficult mm -hmm. it was, you know, and now I really do. So that's, that is like a real feather in cap. And then also like California Bank and Commerce, you guys have had, the bank has had tremendous growth. So the cool thing about getting the venture debt practice going now is that the, the capital is there. Like you guys are, you know, the, the bank is big enough to do these loans, to, to handle it. It's not, you're not kind of over your ski tips. Like the financial success of the bank has, has allowed you really probably to, to get this practice going. Right. Yeah. And I would say that the one thing that Ted does it, it's exceptionally well is he realizes that as we all do in the bank, that banking is not all science. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a blend of art and science. Yeah. And it's, it's like the, it's like the, painting behind Ted on the wall. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not, it's not going to be uniform and the same every time. Yep. And you get, you've got to take each case on its own merits. And that's one thing that this bank does exceptionally yeah. well. Yeah. Exceptionally yeah. I think we've done a good job. Cool. I mean, Tom say, Tom say, obviously not here. Tom says, you know, was one of the founders of bridge bank helped build that, you know, that institution. Um, he's a CFO for our bank here. So he does a good job of optimizing our capital capital. And um, and looking and, and that's why I think we get, you know, narrow and deep in certain industries, technology, venture debt, you know, what we're doing here is is important. So we're, we're able to take those those levels of capital and really optimize on them um, because we're focused. We, you know, we find the right uh, group of folks. We find the expertise. We built you know, a strategy and a plan around it, and then we execute on it. And, and I would say the other part of it too is executing with the capital is making sure you're you're entering the market at a specific spot. You know, like, so I said, when I was at US Bank, you know, we were a trillion dollar institution. You know, we had, we we're OCC regulated. You were based in Minneapolis to say, hey, we're going to go through early round growth capital, you know, right after an A round, you know, that, that wasn't going to fly for them. Right. Not because they felt there yeah. was really kind of, not because they felt like, oh gosh, it was so risky or we just don't understand it. It was optimization of their capital, right? We needed to put, you know, big numbers out. And so we wanted to put 15 out and 20 out and 25 out or syndicate a large deal. So we operate a little bit differently on, on the food chain uh, from that standpoint. And I think here, you know, being a $2 billion bank, and like I said, we've accelerated to 2 billion pretty quickly. Um, yeah. The optimization of our capital, while it's in a different stage of growth, it's still us trying to optimize the capital and get it out and utilize it. And so meaning 
you know, we're here, we're open for business and we want to do deals. And so, um, and I think the institution, you know, Tom and his team has really done a good job of, of doing it and having the experience of doing it, you know, before is always helpful. So. Yeah. Also, I got to say, Ted, like in, you and I have had uh, this conversation separately, but the the thoughtful entry points into the market is so important because I've seen over the years, people enter the venture debt market kind of guns yeah. blazing, not a lot of discretion, not a lot of oversight, not a lot of thinking about what could happen. And they blow themselves out in like a year, 18 months. And as they're collapsing, the clients, yeah. the people that borrowed from them are really yeah. hurt. And so that, that's one of the things that I really like about your team's approach is that you have a ton of experience in the market. So that's not going to happen. That actually gives me pause recommending new entrants into the market because I've seen kind of for folks that don't know if, if an institution retreats, they'll, they'll typically just kind of clamp down and not do restructures or not facilitate, you know, other more capital or things like that. And so the startup that took the loan is in a tough spot. And, and I, I have a ton of faith that even if you guys hit a speed bump or whatever happens, or the economy hits a little speed bump, that you'll have staying yep. power and be able to work with the companies through that. So it's so, so important. Agreed. And and that, that's yeah. why we've tried to be, sorry, Steve, I, I, that's why we try to Go be ahead. thoughtful about it. I mean, again, you know, Steve and I have been in this market for, for a long time and, yeah. uh, you know, we've, we, and we've learned, we've watched, I mean, it's not, we haven't made our own mistakes. Right. And so, but we've learned from watching others and the mistakes they made. And I think ultimately when you, are just getting out and just trying to capture market share and not really thinking about sort of the overall risk profile, not just of the company, but also of the bank and what you're getting into. To your point, Scott, the, the only people that truly get hurt are the entrepreneurs. You know, they, they just get really, yeah, really yeah. in a bad spot. And and again, having our backgrounds, yeah. that's not what we want. And so we want to be thoughtful. And we, we, yeah. we spend a lot, I mean, I'm pretty frank with equity guys and say, hey, here's where we play and think about us. You know, not to say we won't get, you know, you know, maybe we get further down and in, in earlier in the growth stage, but right now we're just a little bit, you know, north of, you know, pre-revenue or something like that, you know, and so we're trying to, we're trying to be smart about it. Um, so we don't put ourselves in a position where we impact the, you know, any of the equity sponsors, but more importantly, you know, the founders and entrepreneurs. Yeah, for sure. Maybe t Ted, maybe take a second to just kind of talk about like your, your sure. target client, like who you're looking for. Um, that way, some of the founders who listen to this can also self-select and and know where you sure. play. Sure. Yeah. So I kind of look. We we kind of look at it from the standpoint of uh, you know, just to, you know, we'll say anywhere from a million to, to you know to, to ten million is sort of our our deal size. Um, we're going to structure um, predominantly to to the market. It's kind of interesting and not to digress, but I get this question all the time: What's your differentiator? What's your differentiator? And you know, and I, I it's a loaded question for me because. You know, for the most part, banking and specifically technology banking, it's 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 fairly commoditized. I mean, the structures are the structures. SVB kind of dictates pricing and dictates you know structure, um, and so you our differentiator is our willingness to participate in the game. Like Steve said, you know, we're willing to compete. You know, and when you said certain banks come in and they just want to do a little bit, or we only want your deposits, or we don't want to do you know you know, pre-profit. So they're not willing to compete in the life cycle. So let me step back a little bit. We can do from the earliest stages, you know, pre-profit lending all the way through the later stages. Okay. That being said, um, we're, we are, we're equity sponsor agnostic, which I think is a differentiator. So we, we are really okay with you know, with bootstrap companies. We're okay with angel backed. We're okay with, uh, you know, uh, friends and family and or, or, or family office, right? You know, there, there's so many great equity sponsors out there that have f fantastic relationships with SVB, Comerica, Bridge, the other institutions. And that's awesome because those banks had spent many years developing those, right? We're, we, we're, quite, we're not quite there yet. So we're a little bit more equity sponsor agnostic. Um, on the earliest stages, you know, we do want to have, we're not pre-revenue, so we, we, we do want to have some revenue. We want to see some growth and some traction in the product and the acceptance of the product. Um, and, and and so that, you know, and we'll do MRR software deals. We'll look at hardware deals. Um, so we're not, again, we're kind of, and I, I'm not saying we're, we're a little bit industry agnostic to some extent. You know, I wouldn't say we're going to do white space lending. You know, we do want to have viable products that have a viable market, you know, that they're accelerating into. 
Um, and and again, one to 15 million or is 15 on the high side. And then I would say structures. Structures are going to be your standard structures. We're going to do, you know, an RML covenant. Um, we'll have a variance to plan covenant. Um, or those are kind of. What's an RML, or a Ted, real fast? Just, I'm not familiar with that term. Re remaining months liquidity. Oh, yeah, okay. so yeah, remaining yeah, months yeah. liquidity. Um, and <laughs> there's there's different formulas. And again, this might be a get, getting a little bit too granular, but um, remaining months liquidity basically is you know how much cash, how much working capital do you have on the balance sheet, which would include cash and yep. your AR and everything relative to your burn. And we want to keep it within a certain months, right? And the whole concept there is we need to have enough liquidity on the balance sheet for you to have time to raise the next round or you have time to get to break even. A lot of times it comes around like, oh, you got RML because you only want me to borrow my own money. No, we want to be there to make sure that, because at the end of the day, you you as an entrepreneur, I, my art is you don't want to have zero either, right? I mean, none of us wants to have zero, right? <laughs> I yeah. mean, so let's just all agree yeah. on that. Nobody wants to have zero cash or negative cash. We can all agree on that, right? So let's just set a limit. We agree what we want to stay Exactly, so let's just set a limit that says, hey, at this mark, you know, we need to have more conversations of how do we raise more money? How do we do more things? Yeah. And then I would also say that, you know, a lot of times with RML calculations, again, this is getting very granular. They, you, um, some banks don't include availability of the debt that we provide. Mm. So we mm. actually include availability of the debt that we provide. So I'm saying, yes, you, you can use our money to make your covenant. You can use your money, our money, you know, to get there. That's the whole reason, right? But the whole fact is it can't be zero, right? Because we don't ever want to get to zero. Sorry, I'm getting close to the camera. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's the remaining months of liquidity. Variance plan is also a very strong covenant for us and simply because um, it keeps us all on the same page, you know, of of what we're, you know, where the company's going. I think it's important as a venture lender for the entrepreneurs, the equity sponsors, and the bankers to be in alignment of what the ultimate goal yeah. is and how we're going to grow this business. And so that's where the plan comes in is really important. So I, I very well said, and I was just going to say the, the remaining months liquidity and variance and <clears throat> other covenants, like you said, you're just trying to have the conversation. And I think sometimes you probably, I don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes I see founders who are not super sophisticated, who push back on some of those terms, not realizing they're borrowing from a bank. They're not yeah. borrowing from a private fund that charges us significantly yeah. more and which will yeah. take more risk. So like uh, my thing is if your banks have a tremendous cost of capital, they'll work with you, but there's, they can't take like equity yeah. risk for a bank debt return. And so that's one of the things I t try to calibrate with our entrepreneurs is like, I, it, it, your lending vehicle should be complementary capital. It should not be what, what the company's running on. It should not be a life or death thing for the sure. company. That's what equity is for. And so, but I think that's where venture debt and, and California bank commerce venture debt group can be so helpful is like, you've got your equity, you know what you're going to do and then borrow some complementary yeah. capital to extend your runway. You're not betting the farm on the bank deal. You're yeah. using it to just extend three to six months, basically. That's that's kind of how agreed. I agreed. And it. I would offer up the, the other part of it because you know there are other institutions that will do no covenant deals um, that yeah. are regulated. Again, but it's based on you know I have you know you know a certain equity sponsor that we always work with, and so we have done you know a hundred deals with them. Yeah, so yeah, we kind of yeah. feel com comfortable with that. And on the flip side of it, I would say because we may put one of these covenants on there, you know, we realize that we're putting more, we're 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 reducing the amount of equity risk that we are having it. Henceforth, we require less from a pricing standpoint on the equity side. Yeah, for and sure. so I think that for so sure. we're you know we're comfortable you know doing in lieu of deals or things like that, because we know we're, we're, you know, I'm, we're not silly. Like, Hey, we're taking equity risk, but we're putting structure on. Right. I realize that there's a give and yeah. take. And so that th those are the give and takes, but you know, yeah. I, I was going to so, say too, I, th I think sometimes the covenants can be viewed as, um, as punitive or, uh, or a way for the bank to exit a deal. And I think that's, that's not the appropriate way to look at covenants because I think covenants are really for the benefit I think they're there for the benefit of the company too, yep. because it can sometimes these covenants can help. They're they're really meant to be triggers. Say, you know, has something changed in the business 
fundamentally yeah. that's different than when we originally when we originally crafted this agreement. Yep. And that's really what, to me, and, and to me, that's what the essence yep. of it is. It's yeah. just, it's just a, it's to get, it's to create an opportunity for dialogue. If we, if the dialogue is probably happening already, but to, if, if for some reason it hasn't to foster dialogue and, and stop and look at the picture and say, what's different now than it was when we set this three, six, nine or 12 months ago. Yeah. And it, I, do, it doesn't mean that it's a permanent change. It, it could be, it could be a permanent change. It could be a temporary change, but something's changed. Something's different now. Yep. Yeah. So the question is what's different now than when we did this in the past and can come up with a constructive yep. solution that and benefits everybody. A, and, and it's yeah. not meant to say, Oh, you know, by the way, um, we're done because yeah. you violated your covenant and it's time yeah. for us to leave. Oh, and we wrote, we wrote, <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, I gotta say though, some people act that way. That's why I like, yeah, no, I, mean, are. And, and, you know, it, it, only, I would say the only reason, the only time that it actually comes to that is when Scott, we've called you for six months and we can't get a hold of you. Oh, for sure. That us. used to drive me crazy and, too. And, and we yeah. don't have any, yeah. we don't have any other remedy at this point, but to exercise our, exercise yeah. our covenant. Yeah. Right? Communicate. The, for, that's a really awesome kind of meta point there. Communicating with your lender is so valuable. Well, I, I, I operate like this at Lighthouse and I know you guys operate at this. Those, if the dialogue's going, you get so much more leeway, you know, like they can work. You, and oftentimes you can really help solve any problem as long as things are going yeah. well and there's clear communication. It's when radio silence happens yeah. when things get a little scary. Yeah. And it's like, we talk about this all the time. We I actually, you know, we, prior to starting this whole, getting our uh, policies and everything approved, you know, I, I had written a white paper to kind of go through the, for the board and, and everybody to understand sort of the nature of technology lending, what you're getting into. And, and one of the things we talk about going back to covenants, like variance to plan being, you know, a strong covenant um, because it keeps us on the same page. And I said, but here's the thing. Many times a company will come to say, Hey, you know, I need to change the plan and guess what? I need to burn a little more cash, but I need to burn cash in, and I say in a positive way, because, you know, I need to develop product that is going to help, you know, escalate the revenue ramp or I'm, you know, getting new clients yeah. or I need to buy more of something else. So we're comfortable with all that stuff. You know, these positive influences that take you, you know, maybe even have you burn more, but then put you in a better ramp rate. You know, that those are things that are through communication. We're like, that's fine. We're totally good with that. Right. Um, that yeah, works out yeah, well. Yeah. So, <laughs> I I totally agree. There's there's one other just to kind of change the topic slightly that you mentioned when you're you know equity agnostic, which I thought was is a really interesting trend. Which is you mentioned family offices and doing kind of direct equity investing into startups. And ten years ago, I would have said like, ooh, that's not that's not a great way for family offices to deploy capital because a lot of the people who were doing the family office stuff didn't have a lot of direct deal experience yeah. and things like that. But I've seen kind of a sea change over the last maybe five years where the family offices are getting more sophisticated. So they're hiring people who are, you know, great fund choosers and evaluators, but also hiring people who are direct deal people as well. Are you are you seeing that? And is that what's giving you more comfort on the on the kind of kind of backing companies that have a family office? Definitely. Um uh, definitely. And I wouldn't say the level of sophistication, the diversification of where they look for um, return mm. has happened. Obviously, these are family offices that have been around for a long time. They have sophistication in how they invest. Um, but having deployed capital into into different markets, and that's where they're hiring people to understand some of these direct yep. investments. And, and, I, and, and you're starting to see some, some, some good returns out of there. And it's interesting, I've seen even some family offices that want to do almost like a fund of funds, right? They're trying to find the right funds to get into. And then that's been difficult because you can't always get into it. So that's when they start looking for deal flow. Um, that's totally yeah. it. I'm seeing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Maybe you can tell everyone how to how to reach out sure. if they're a founder and interested in a debt deal or if they're a venture capitalist listening to this and want to find a new partner. Um, how can they reach out to you guys and, and, and get in touch? Sure, Steve. Sure, there's. You can certainly visit our website at www.californiabankofcommerce.com. But I would say that the best way is to reach out to either Ted or myself directly, and uh, I I can be reached at um, s t e s s l e r s tesler at bank b a n k c b c dot com. So bankcbc.com is our domain name for email, not for yeah. our website. 
and and uh, I can be reached at yeah I can be reached at T Bohorquez that's T B O J O R Q U E Z at bankcbc.com. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I'm super excited about the Venture Dead Initiative, and uh, again, I was I felt like I was in a foxhole a little bit with Steve during COVID, <laughs> and was you guys really helped me out and helped the cruise client base out. So really appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll get Our to. It's, we're recording in August of 2021. Hopefully. We don't have another winter of like that yes. and chaos again. Awesome. So Hopefully not another fingers crossed crossed and, uh, Well, thank you, Scott. We appreciate and, your time. Uh, and appreciate you having us. Well, Scott, if there is one, you know who to call. So. I, yes, I will. I will text you like I did every day. Awesome, guys. Thank you thank so you. much. Appreciate it. Bye. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye.